Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be making a start at the very least on my review of Fairy Tale by Stephen King. So at the time of filming, this is his newest. I'm going to read you the blurb on the back cover, then I'm going to go through and check out some of my tabs, and then I'll share my overall thoughts and rating at the end. Uh, in fact, that back cover is an excerpt. Here we go, on the inside cover we have a blurb. Dane reads... Legendary storyteller Stephen King goes into the deepest well of his imagination, I like the reference to the well there, in this spellbinding novel about a 17 year old boy who inherits the keys to a parallel world where good and evil are at war and the stakes could not be higher for their world or ours. Charlie Reed looks like a regular high school kid, great at baseball and football, a decent student, but he carries a heavy load. His mum was killed in a hit and run accident when he was 10 and grief drove his dad to drink. Charlie learned how to take care of himself and his dad. Then, when Charlie is 17, he meets a dog named Radar and her aging master, Howard Bowditch, a recluse in a big house at the top of a big hill with a locked shed in the backyard. Sometimes strange sounds emerge from it. Charlie starts doing jobs for Mr. Bowditch and loses his heart to Radar. Then, when Bowditch dies, he leaves Charlie a cassette tape telling a story no one will believe. What Bowditch knows, and has kept secret all his long life, is that inside the shed is a portal to another world. King's storytelling in fairy tale soars. This is a magnificent and terrifying tale about another world than ours, in which good is pitted against overwhelming evil, and a heroic boy and his dog must lead the battle. So yeah, it's got kind of it's got gritty realism to it, but also elements of like portal fantasy. Kind of reminded me of the Spear Wielder trilogy by R.A. Salvatore, which is about just a normal American dude called Gary Lager, I think his name was, who finds like a portal to another world and ends up having to become the hero. So this basic opening line, it kind of establishes things. It sets up this this kid as the main sort of narrator um, and sets up the first person. So it goes, I'm sure I can tell this story. I'm also sure no one will believe it. That's fine with me. Telling it will be enough. My problem, and I'm sure many writers have it, not just newbies like me, is deciding where to start. Very relatable. So his dad's an insurance claims adjuster and he tells the kid uh, that the only pure accident he ever heard of was a man in Arizona who was killed when a meteor hit him on this head. There's always someone at fault, dad said, which is not the same as blame. Do you blame the man who hit mum? I asked. He thought about it, raised his glass to his lips and drank. This was six or eight months after mom died and he'd pretty much given up on beer. By then he was strictly a Gilby's man. I try not to, and mostly I can do that unless I wake up at two in the morning with nobody in the bed but me. Then I blame him. Which I just thought sort of speaks to the, you know, inherent human weakness we all have. His dad uh, calls New Year's Eve uh, amateur night. It's a thing that apparently alcoholics refer to New Year's Eve as. And his dad loses his job. He says, I seem to have lost my job, Charlie. Or if I can quote Bobcat Goldthwait, I know where it is, but someone else is doing it. Or soon will be. So he's, he's looking after his dad while he's drunk and we get, he looked up at me with an expression I'd never seen before, even after mum died. I hate to say this, but I'm going to because that's what I thought then. It was the expression of a dog that's taken a shit on the floor. So eventually he goes to AA um, and the kid, he picks up a lot of the slogans that AA people are always spouting. He said, I liked you can't turn a pickle back into a cucumber and God don't make junk. But the one that stuck with me and does to this day is something I heard uh, Lindy tell dad one night when dad was talking about all the unpaid build and how he was afraid of losing the house. Lindy said my father getting sober was a miracle. Then he added, but miracles ain't magic. So he meets Mr. Bowditch, the old, elderly neighbor who's had a fall and is in, in a lot of pain. So he gives him some pills that have expired in August 2004. And Bowditch says, just give them to me. Whatever does not kill me makes me stronger. Don't suppose you know who said that, do you? They teach you nothing these days. Nietzsche, I said. Twilight of the Idols. I'm taking world history this quarter. And he goes to meet Radar, the dog that they were all scared of as a kid. And, he, and it says, after a moment or two, she came to it, sniffed and gave it a little lick. So much for Cujo the Terrible. Which is nice because obviously King wrote Cujo. And we get a reference to the Chinese proverb. Save a man's life and you're responsible for him thereafter. Um, but he's, he's uh, basically, he, when his dad was a drunk, he prayed to God that he would do anything if his dad got off the drink. And then when his dad did, it kind of inspired him to want to do some good. So that's why he ends up helping Mr. Bowditch. We get a reference to Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. We actually get a few of those and it's clear that that's kind of inspired this novel. To the point at which Bradbury might have visited the fairy tale land and got some of his ideas from there. We get a reference to the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski, domestic terrorist. Fascinating person, same personality type as me as well. But obviously morally wrong, but... We get a reference to Jacob Marley and these are the chains I wore in life. And uh, Bowditch goes, read the book or seen the movie. Movie every Christmas Eve on TCM. We watch a lot of TCM at our house. And Bowditch doesn't know what that is because he doesn't have cable. 
Bodit says, hospitals and prisons, not much difference in how they run their businesses, except with prisoners, except with prisons, it's the taxpayers who wind up footing the bill. And we learn, a fee fi fo fum I smell the blood of an Englishman was cribbed from King Lear, where a character named Edgar says, child Roland to the Dark Tower came. His word was still fee fo and fum I smell the blood of a British man. And he ends up cleaning Mr. Bodic, and, um, because he accidentally craps himself. And Charlie says, don't worry about it, I clean up Radar's crap in the backyard all the time. He gave me his patented, was you born stupid look. That's different, Radar is a dog, she'd shit on the lawn in front of the Eiffel Tower if you let her. I found this mildly interesting, is there a lawn in front of the Eiffel Tower? Now came, now came the patented Bowditch eye roll, I don't know, I was making a point. I guess there is, there's some grassy areas anyway. He says, it's all water under the bridge, and Bowditch says, time is the water Charlie, life is just the bridge it flows under, which I thought was a good little line. And Bowditch starts giving himself sponge downs, which he called whores baths. I've had to have whores baths before because of my dodgy plumbing. And we call them that as well. And Mr. Bowditch says, the humour of young people is crude and rarely funny. Which is sometimes true, I guess. And Bowditch asks him to get some whiskey. And Charlie says, whiskey doesn't smell the same as gin, yet it does. All alcohol smells the same to me, of sadness and loss. And Bowditch knows that he's dying, and so he tells someone he doesn't intend to buy any green bananas. And then we get another reference there to something wicked this way come. He's thinking about secrets, and he thinks about a quote from Benjamin uh, Franklin. Three may keep a secret if two of them are dead. Another reference to something wicked, and also um, some references to fairy tales, which obviously this is inspired by. I didn't read any of the fairy tales, only ran down the contents and skimmed the introduction. I was interested, but not entirely surprised to find that most of the ones I knew from childhood had darker versions. The original of Goldilocks and the Three Bears was an oral tale that had been around since the 1500s and there was no little girl named Goldilocks in it. The main character was a vile old woman who invaded the bear's home, basically broke all their shit, then jumped out a window and ran away into the woods cackling. Rumpelstiltskin was even worse. In the version I vaguely remembered, old Rumpel flew away in a huff when the girl tasked with spinning straw into gold guessed his name. In the 1857 version of Grimm's, he drove one foot into the ground, grasped the other and tore himself apart. I thought that was a horror story worthy of the Saw franchise. And so anyway, then, then he goes through the portal and ends up in this other world and we get, I hadn't been able to say nickname. I hadn't been able to say awesome sauce. Would I be able to say Wiesenheimer or Knuckle Sandwich or yo, you tripping? I wasn't positive I knew what that inability meant, but I was pretty sure. I thought Dora understood me because she understood English, but what if she'd understood me because I had spe been speaking her language? One where words like nickname and awesome source didn't exist. And so as we get into the sort of the second half of the story, once we get into like the portal fantasy bit, I did enjoy it still, just not as much as the more gritty realistic stuff, so I have fewer tab. And we get, I clipped Radar's leash to her collar. I didn't want her chasing any giant rabbits into the woods and meeting this world's version of a Game of Thrones dire wolf. Which is interesting because King and Martin obviously are aware of each other, they've been on panels together. We talk about someone, he can't feel wounds unless he sees blood. He eats, but he has no sense of whether his stomach is full or empty. My god, I had thought that being blind must be the worst, but it wasn't. Well, I have that stomach thing, but it's just because I have IBS. So he's trying to rescue uh, Radar, who's getting old, and he's asked, Do you love her enough to die with her? I shook my head. Claudia surprised me with a laugh that was always, almost musical. I thought it was one small remnant of what her voice had been like before she had been cursed to a life of silence. Not a noble answer, but those who answer nobly have a way of dying young with their pants full of shit. So she's kind of writing out her responses to him. He's talking about one of his friends. Um, she worshipped a punk band called the Dead Kennedys, could quote lines from Taxi Driver and loved the stories and poems of H.P. Lovecraft. She sounds fun. Um, this was kind of cool. It shows the differences between this world and our world. In my world, I believed and I wasn't alone. All that royalty business was so much bullshit. Fodder for supermarket tabloids like the National Enquirer and Inside View. Kings and queens, princes and princesses were just another family, but one that had looked into all the right numbers in the genetic version of Mega Millions. They took down their britches when they had to shit, just like the lowliest peons. But this wasn't that world. This was Empis where the rules were different. This really was the other. And at one point he says, I didn't exactly sound like myself and not for the first time. I sounded more like a character in a book or a movie. I almost expected to hear myself say, my name is Inigo Montoya, you killed my father, prepare to die. Which is from the Princess Bride, cracking movie. Okay book, cracking movie. One of the few where the, the movie's better than the book. And uh, he finds a castle and he says, the entire place which had absolutely no symmetry seemed to be moving like Howl's Castle. Which is a nice little reference to Howl's Moving Castle, Diane Wynne-Jones and Studio Ghibli, obviously. So we get some more references to Game of Thrones. Something else, Hamie said the Galleons had ruled Empis for time out of mind, but that family tree has been chopped down. Yet it also seemed to contradict himself. In a way, they still do. Did that mean Flight Killer was of, what, the House of Galleon, like in a royalty-centric George R.R. R. Martin Game of Thrones novel? That seemed wrong because Lyra told me, through her horse of course, that her four sisters and two brothers were dead. 
Also her mother and father, presumably the king and queen. So who did that leave? Some bastard like Jon Snow in the Thrones books. The crazy hermit somewhere in the woods. Let me get this a little bit. Given a choice between another bowl of chicken stew and seeing daylight, I would have picked daylight. Easy to say when your belly's full, I thought. Some little references here. Here's a little side note that isn't a side note at all. Just wait for it. I read Dracula in the summer before seventh grade. This was also at the urging of Jenny Schuster, that person mentioned earlier who was into the dead Can Kennedys. Not long before she and her family moved to Iowa. I was going to read Frankenstein. I had it from the library, but she said it was boring. A shit ton of bad writing combined with a lot of bullshit philosophy. Dracula, she said, was a hundred times better. The coolest vampire story ever written. I don't know, Fra uh, Frankenstein's very good as well, but again, it has the philosophy, but that's kind of the point of it, you know? And we get, there are other worlds than these, Charlie, which is very uh, Dark Tower, isn't it? Oh, and then we get a toneless bray, which is just a line of capital A's that grew even louder. And funnily enough, I use a line of capital A's in my books when I'm working on them to kind of delineate where I'm up to, so I can just do a, a find for a line of A's and I'll, I'll find it. But that would have driven me nuts if I'd written this book, because I would have kept finding that line. And this came up in an Edward Lorne book I read recently. Uh, and Edward Lorne is a big Stephen King fan, but his book came out first, so kudos uh, Edward for that. Uh, when we got to the top of the steps, I had to sit down. My head was throbbing now, as well as my arm. I remembered reading somewhere that when it comes to starting a dangerous, perhaps even lethal infection, nothing but the bite of a rabid animal beats one from a supposedly healthy human. And how was I to know how healthy Petra had been after years of commerce? My mind balked at the idea of actual Congress with Eldon. I imagined I could feel a poison coursing up my arm to the shoulder, and from there to my heart. Telling myself I was full of shit didn't help much. And it ends with him saying, um... Do I dream, you ask? Of course. Some of them are of the thing that came out of the well, and I wait from those of my hands over my mouth to stifle my screams. But as the years pass, those nightmares come less. More often these days, I dream of a field blanketed in poppies. I dream of red hope. We did the right thing, I know that. The only thing. And still my dad keeps an eye on the house at 1 Sycamore Street. I come back often and do the same, and eventually I will come back to Century for good. I may marry, and if I have children, the house on the hill will go to them. And when they are small and wonder is all they know, I will read them the old stories, the ones that start once upon a time. And finally, in the, in the acknowledgements, um, King says, One other thing, I have a Google alert on my name, and over the years, last year, I've seen many obituaries of those lost to COVID who have enjoyed my books. Too many. I mourn the passing of each one and send condolences to the surviving friends and family members. I have Google alerts for my name as well, and actually, funnily enough, I do some writing coaching, and that's something that I suggest that all of the students do, is to set up a Google alert for their name. But overall, Fairy Tale by Stephen King, I did very much enjoy it. Now, I don't normally like fairy tale retellings, but this, in a way, wasn't one. It took the idea of fairy tales and used that to create something new. Um, so it worked well because of that. It's also King, so it's hard not to like that. It's a bit Portal Fantasy, um, which again isn't for everybody, but again, it, it worked well for me. But I did enjoy the stuff that's set in our world more than the stuff set in the other world but I understand why both were necessary to tell the story. Overall, I gave Fairy Tale by Stephen King pretty solid four out of five. So there we have it, that's what I made of Fairy Tale by Stephen King. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit that subscribe button for more, and I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.